Welcome to um, ResPublica's uh, fifth year anniversary. If you're at the back, please do come forward. Uh, we've got tables reserved for you um, at the front. You will see in, in front of you that you have a little card. This is for our question time event for the panel, which we will hold shortly, the big left-right panel. It's not meant as an insult to any of the other parties, merely just an acknowledgement that the government is likely to feature one of these uh, two sides. So what I'd like you to do during the um, next uh, 20 minutes or so is think of your most pertinent and pressing question. Uh, the issue that you feel remains unaddressed by our current political parties. Fill it in and my colleagues will collect uh, those cards from you and we will present uh, them to our compa, Faisal Islam, um, who will be doing his best Dimbleby impression, which I understand is uh, very good indeed, and uh, we'll be chairing uh, the question time. We'll sort the questions and then, when, as with question time, we'll ask the person who asked it to raise it, and then we'll have the debate. Well, I, I think it's con our, the continued existence of Res Publica, without uh, core funding, without being captured by any of the established parties, is for me yet more evidence of the proof of the existence of God. And it reminds me of my favourite theologian, Henri de Lubac who argued that actually everything that was was the greatest uh, mystery and you didn't need to go into the supernatural since it was the natural itself that was a miracle. So, as it were, you're here for the fifth year and I hope it will go on to the 10th and the 50th and on and on until it's time to stop, of course, um, to celebrate this. What I wanted to discuss with you tonight is quite where we are, because I think we're in a unique and potentially very dangerous situation. I think domestically it's a bit like the 1970s, as my uh, uh, friend Steve Richards of The Independent put it to me uh, a while ago, he said it is like the 1970s, and indeed it is, it's an interregnum. But the difference between now and the 1970s is then the left was dead, but the right wasn't. And it was very clear that the right uh, had a whole new set of ideas and agenda that would soon dominate the landscape. Now I would suggest to you both left and right are dead. In some sense, they've been surpassed. Nobody, if you look at way, the way people are voting for the new insurgent parties, they're all an odd mixture of left and right. It may be, in some very real way, the spectrum that we've inherited from the French Revolution of left and right is somehow passé. And actually, I think there's some evidence there to do that. Perhaps more worrying on the international scale, it's a bit like the 1930s rather than the 1970s. We've got ever more extreme forms of um, Islam, not just at the southern borders of uh, Europe, but obviously in all countries as well. We've got a Russia whose political uh, stability is predicated on an oil price that is twice what it is now. Quite what Russia will do when its present settlement is threatened, and it looks like that might happen in the next six to nine months in terms of paying everybody's pensions, well, it doesn't really bear thinking about, but I think we're already seeing some evidence of it. But to the point at issue, nobody in Europe is doing majority politics. Even the CDU fear that their majority will leave them when Merkel does. Across Europe, I think we're seeing uh, insurgent parties of left and right, coloured left and right at the same time, on the brink of winning. I suspect Sinn Féin might win in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, the SNP, in some sense, has already won in Scotland. Um, we have our own dear UKIP. We have Front National in France, we have the Freedom Party in Austria polling above the, Go the Grand Coalition, Podemas in Spain, we know that uh, Syriza looks like it could easily win in Greece, Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, Jobbik in Hungary, they came second in the local elections in last October, 
And even the lovely Social Democrats in Sweden, 15% of them are voting for a Nazi party. So much for Nirvana up north. The lesson is clear. Within or without the EU, the extremists of both left and right are beginning to win the peace. Standard parties are failing all over Europe and the West. The only outliers, Canada and Australia, are largely because they're relatively sheltered from globalization. One has oil wealth and is next to the, one of the largest growth economies in the world, and the other essentially has the resources of a mineral-rich continent divided uh, by a very small number of people. America itself <coughs> has seen its global position essentially fall away, largely because it has a duopoly governance that is so polarized that it can only ever swing more wildly and fruitlessly between the two wings. What's going on and why? Let's tackle the issue of the UK first. In uh, our country, all the main parties are stuck on 32, 33%. Labour a little bit more, the Conservatives always waiting for that extra 1%, 2% that they feel will come as people's innate uh, caution uh, dawns on them as the election approaches. That doesn't look like happening. Why, though, can none of the major parties create a majority offer? Largely, I would argue, because they are all prisoners of the past. The UK's electoral system was not specifically designed to prevent new market entry all would be out of office by now. None of the old parties, if I can call them that, and I'm all in favour of uh, age, not least because I'm no longer 30, um, but none of the old parties are speaking to the new constituency that is desperate for a new advocate and new directions. What is this new constituency? What is this new electoral reality? Simply put, I believe, uh, as I would, that it was as I outlined in 2010 in Red Tory. There I argued that all future majorities would be socially conservative. In, in that sense, they would be about a social and cultural politics about their people, their places, and a concern for the future of their families and communities. If you do global polling, and I do, and you ask what are people's dominant worries, whatever sector they're in, always in the top three is concern for their children or for their grandparents. And one of the things that is uh, so disturbing is that we haven't had on offer from any of the main parties a cultural politics that can speak to our contemporary disenchantments. And the only people who are doing cultural politics are the extremists and the racists and the narrow sectarian nationalists. Also, I argued that there was a desperate need for a new economic settlement. One that would speak to the current failure of wages to deliver very much at all. In this, I think the Labour Party are clearly right. There is a cost of living crisis, but it's been going on for 30 to 40 years. If you look at the average wage of a skilled uh, or semi-skilled manual labourer in America, as a proportion of GDP, it's been declining since 1970. What we've seen is women enter the workforce, rapid increase in wages, and then plateaus. And we've seen the household taking on more and more debt. We've seen the state taking on more and more debt. And we've seen debt oscillate in public and private Keynesianism between the two. Something is clearly awry, and we need economic answers, and none are currently forthcoming. I would suggest that what I argued in, in 2010, I would suggest this respectfully, reality has largely borne this out. From UKIP in the South, which among many things is clearly culturally conservative and economically demanding of a new settlement, to the SNP in the North, that are narrow sectarian nationalists, which is a form, a negative form, of cultural conservatism, as well as old welfare and statist. And I think what we're seeing, if you take if you look at the Front National in France, if you take the racism out of it, it's an old state welfareist socialist offer. And you see this time and time again. That, you see that there is a strange hybrid developing where whoever wins is whoever offers security. And this offer of security is becoming ever more primitive, ever more dangerous, and ever more aware and critical of globalization. And if you want a really good example of that, look at UKIP. Here you have a communitarian party led by libertarians. 
I said to Douglas Carswell, when, has libertari when have libertarians ever, ever helped the poor, ever, on, in the history of the universe? And to give him credence, he then talked about the sin taxes that the poor pay. But I said, that's not enough, Douglas. When are you going to create an ownership uh, offer that can actually stop people being poor? And because he's a clever man, he didn't immediately respond. And I'd be interested to see what happens. You can see it in UKIP, where the conference is already going quite left-wing. We can see a development of a northern working-class constituency that is so dissatisfied with the present offer, it's not hard to see that the future of UKIP is a working-class, nationalist, protectionist party. And the libertarian leadership in, will, in my view, be soon eclipsed. And the position of UKIP might well be somewhat akin to Front National. Anyway, how did we get here? Why did we go so wrong? I think that it's best, these things are best addressed by looking at the our own recent tragedies. Let's take Tory modernisation as a particularly astute example. <coughs> the Tory modernisation that was uh, eventually adopted was never modern enough. The modernisation was simply a regression to the Blairite past. As figured by the economically and socially liberal enclave, modernisation was meant to fi finally expunge the last of conservatism from the Conservative Party. This approach has split the right and led directly to the current rise of UKIP. The alternative to the approach uh, that could have been adopted was there in the work of Steve Hilton, it was there in Tim Montgomery's work and IDS's, and it was there in the approach I advocated. If any of these um, policy approaches had been adopted, the Conservative Party wouldn't be at 32-33%, but would be polling, in my view, in the 40s. The Conservative Party, unfortunately, remains offering a southeastern diagnosis and southeastern solutions for the rest of the country. It is inextricably linked to winners, has no account of those who lose, and no sympathy for them and has failed to create a world in which those who fall behind, and remember more and more of us are, and especially the middle class, and fail to create a way in which they can have a vision of a secure and prosperous future. Thatcherism redux will never enjoy a majority in this country again, and I sometimes wonder if the Conservative Party realises this. By the same token, a similar path was open to the Labour Party, and at times one thought optimistically, my goodness, they might yet have it. The adoption of One Nation Labour was right, and I thought it was a brilliant piece of strategy, and it remains Ed Billiband's best conference speech and best ever speech. But the disaster for this was that this idea was never fully populated. John Crudus's Boo Labour Policy Review was never fully adopted, which I think laid the pathway to a genuine majority offer. And I wish Boo Labour well, and I wish it to develop well, because I think that is the pathway, though I think it doesn't yet have the policies, for creating an offer. So in short, both parties are captured in their old model. The right is captured in a market that manifestly cannot raise the prosperity of all, as currently constructed. As currently conceived, it is captured by monopolies, cartels, and oligopolies. The idea of markets raising the many is the right idea. It's the, right, it's the idea that Hayek had and the idea that all good free market economists have. But we don't have it anymore. I think you all know Piketty's work. I'm sure you studied it very closely. And I particularly think Piketty's recognition that when the rate of return on capital grows higher than the rate of return on the economy, you will only ever have concentration of wealth. Deirdre McCluskey, though, made a very good point in a review of Piketty. She said, from a right-wing point of view, what, McClus what uh, Piketty doesn't realise and has obviously no awareness of is the concept of market entry. New, market, new players enter the market, new competition is engendered, and capital that's established is challenged and more capital is created. And actually, McCluskey is right. It's very clear that over time, real wages of workers over a long period have risen dramatically. But 
that isn't enough because absolutes, looking back, don't matter to human beings. Human beings, what matters are relative comparisons. It's not for nothing that those who win Oscars live four years longer than those who are just nominated. <laughs> that tells you human beings compare for social status. And what I think the critiques of Piketty don't realize is we live in a world now where we've centralized status and in comparing ourselves to those, to those who win, most people feel like losers and this has absolutely damaging consequences for also, we produce competition without competitors. Much of our competition is between leaders and laggards. Most of our markets are dominated by established players. Markets that used to have 10, 15, 20 players, they're gone. In the name of price competition exclusively, we just normally have two or three big players who are the leaders, and new market entrants everywhere are laggards. The only real exception to this are areas like tech, but they soon get bought out. Until the right recognises the current reality of monopoly and cartel, and cartel control, until it broadens its concepts of competition to the old European ideal that competition must mean plurality of ownership, we cannot have a right that is genuinely dedicated to economic and social justice. For the right, creating more owners, creating the ability to trade and market entry is a must. But nobody, nobody on the right is arguing this, and capitalism remains the blind spot. And it's this that will keep them from creating a productive capitalism. <coughs> the left, by the same token, has still not escaped the grip of the state. The left has not realised that the state is the agent of inequality, not its solution. Everywhere that the state operates, it operates on the idea of centralization and universalization. That means everybody must get the same thing everywhere. But what does that mean? That means that nobody gets what they need anywhere. That means that those who desperately need help with skills, mental health, or anything else, are never going to get it. That's why we already have the postcode lottery. Then the state itself is incredibly inefficient in terms of the funding lines it pumps into areas. Different parts of the state conflict and fight with one another. We did a paper, Devo Mac, Devo Manx, or something like that. We discovered 1,500 funding lines from the state going into Greater Manchester, each with its own overhead, each with its own model of performance, all of which cost an enormous amount of money. McKinsey have shown that 30% of every <coughs> layer of management comes out of your frontline budget. Until we can turn the state inside out, until we can localise the state, we're not going to have an efficient state. And if you travel around the north as I do, and you see the wastelands of northern schools and of northern public services and the people who are dependent on them, it's an ongoing tragedy. So the solution, I think, is clear for the new politics. The new politics will have to create a market-based offer that isn't inter interested so much in consumption but in production and is interested in creating a world where small business doesn't necessarily remain small as market share but can actually go to scale. If we only have one market where we can create a capital impact, which is housing, we'll create an investment bubble that gets more and more expensive and nobody can afford, and we see it here in London readily. We've got to create multiple points for market access, multiple ways to invest, and until we do that, we won't have popular prosperity. We also have to change the state inside out. We have to radically decentralize and create place-based localism that can create the type of integrated public services that alone can transform the lives of the poor. Now, at Res Publica, I would argue we've been doing this for five years. Our very first paper was the ownership state that called for mass mutualization of public services, uh, not privatization, because I think that just creates external costs and doesn't really deliver on integration, not nationalization for the reasons I said earlier. And our last but one paper was on full devolution to Manchester. In the middle, we've argued for military academies, we argued for uh, green energy, we've argued for diversity in the banking sector, and I've even argued that bankers should take an oath. So we're that idealistic and we still remain so. For the work that we have going forward, we've got lots of very radical ideas. 
We want to tackle, and let me just give you some of the problems and the issues, we want to tackle why so many women drop out of the workforce after they have children and are sundered from education and training. In terms of small businesses, we want to ask why do sole traders have to pay their tax in advance of receiving the income on which they are taxed so that they are driven out of business, whereas companies can issue returns and pay only after they know how much they've earned. If ever there was a detriment, there is one. We want to ask, can there be ways in which, or when our police and our hospitals lose their way, can they be repurposed? Can we think of a way in which we can recover them? We also want to tackle the rampant ugliness of our contemporary world. What people most object to and why they object to development is development is so often ugly. Think of the cost to the developers and to society. If people were given a greater say in shaping and making things beautiful, there'd be far less resistance to it. We also want a radical settlement for the North because all the gains that we need for the North of our country aren't going to be won just by local authorities being devolved to. We need something bigger, better, regional even. So finally, I want to say, if you look on your table, you can see both the, our map of our strategy for the coming year. We'll be announcing our manifesto in the new year. We've got 10 ideas to change everything, and they'll be very radical indeed. Our work will continue. We did an analysis of our reports. We think about 80 to 85% of our ideas have entered public policy. The last, of course, was devolution to Manchester, which was adopted within eight weeks. I'm told people have done better, but I'm quite pleased with it anyway. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd now like to ask the, uh, those who are engaging in our question time debate to come forward. If you could fill in your cards, my colleagues will come and collect them. Thank you very much, everyone.